Now, if I were to ask you who was the only Irish trainer to record a winner over the two days in Longchamp on Prix de l'Arc de Triomphe last weekend, would you know the answer? And if not, listen to this. Next, they've got two furlongs to go from here. And Air de Vals and the Winter Power, the two showing in together. Pontos is behind him in third position. Glass Slippers has moved into third now. Most of the leaders in there as well. As Sueza comes next as they hit down the closing stages. But Air de Vals is clear with Ronan Thomas. A case of you has moved into second position to give chase. But it's Air de Vals, a case of you closing with every stride. Air de Vals all being joined by case of you. Roughly how many times have you heard that commentary since last week, Edo? Oh, I've heard it a lot of times. I've watched it. And I'm in bad form now. I just turn that on and watch it. Edo <laughs> McGuinness is our guest on the show this week, which is good timing because you recorded an unbelievable Group 1 victory uh, on Arc Weekend when a case of you uh, got up on the line. And these are the fine margins, Edo. Five lengths back to third, and you literally are talking inches, if not milli- millimetres, to get up on the line here on the Ronan Whelan. Yeah, would look at it. it was a close call, okay. And even when he crossed the line, I didn't know where we up or not. And Eddie Lynham kept telling me, but I, I'd run down off the stand, and Eddie kept saying, "You're up, you're up, you're up." And I still wasn't believing him until I heard that call. You know, until I heard the photo being called. And look at it, it was a long—I don't know how long it was, probably a minute or so before it was called. But it was a long time now waiting. But it was just an unreal moment then. Did you look back in your Fitbit to see the old heart rate over that minute or so? I'd say I'd say it would have blown up. <laughs> yeah, well, that's un- it's understandable, really, when you're when you're talking such fine margins. And even if you watch that race back, it's very very hard to tell who got up. Yeah, and I, I suppose in, in a lot of photo finishes, you always you always favour the horse that's that's coming. You know, that not the horse that's fading; it's the horse that's you know that's getting there. And the same thing happened to me last year. I've been lucky with photo finishes with Sarton Star last year in the Galway Mile. Like he he just got up as well and. It took them a lot longer to call that one. So, but he he uh, look at it was it was a close call. But at the end of the day, we passed the finishing post first, and that's the main thing. Yeah, if I suppose if if the Breeders' Cup is the World Cup of horse racing, um, maybe the Arc is something like the European Championships or something like that. Edo, can you can you sum up what what was the weekend like? Uh, your trainer going to Paris, uh, which I think uh, everyone would um, like to be doing at any time of year. But you're going to Paris Arc weekend with a proper proper uh, chance in a Group One, and it all comes off. How did your weekend go? When did you go over there? How long did you stay? Where did you stay? Did you enjoy yourself? Did you get to the James Joyce Bar? And did you get home? I got home Monday morning. I was a bit rattled, okay, but I drove to Tipperary after it to to the races. I had a runner, a couple of runners in Tipperary. Um, we went, we flew out Friday night because I wanted to see the horses on Saturday morning myself. You know, we we're giving them a little bit of a canter. And um, look, at, I, I'd, I've never been in Longchamp before. I've been in Paris on my honeymoon, okay, but I've never been in Longchamp. And as I said, which was a long time ago when I was on my honeymoon, um, it, I've never been there. It was just a fabulous place it's ah, oh, it's just it's hard to describe it but it's a really really like it's an unreal daunting place when you when you arrive into it and um we like saturday we sort of just chilled out with the horses were in great form did i rubbed up and we, we you know i was very hopeful that that they were going to run a big race i went racing that saturday afternoon watched all the racing and then come back in we done the horses over and fed them and you know all they did was eat sleep and drink which is the main thing for a horse to do and not fret up and that's exactly what he did do and Sunday there was a lot of rain falling Ian, Ian rang me Sunday morning he said God he said this might be on he said it's raining that hard the place was floating and like the ground did take the rain plenty you know it took it well but it was testing you know it was heavy it was it, not extremes but it was testing enough conditions and um I went back and I walked. I walked over and I walked the track, then the, the Abbey track, which is they have where, where the sprint track is in Longchamp. It's only it's the only race on it for the day, so it wasn't where I was going to get chewed up or that. And they always tell me like you sort of nearly run downhill for four furlongs, and they always tell me that the ins, an inside draw is a great draw to have, and we were drawn five, which was a great advantage to us. And, you know, I, I said this horse. You know, I knew they were going to go fast and. People say, oh, he, you know, they mightn't lie up, but I knew he'd finish. Like, he, he, he's a sprinter that stays, and that's exactly what you want in a top-class sprinter, and that's exactly what he is. What was the conversation yeah. with Ronan Whelan beforehand? Oh, look, what I didn't say how Pyle Ronnie was beating himself up a little bit over 
the flying five. He said, oh, I said, I should have won it. And I said, look, don't worry. I said, I would have settled for a second. I was a little good at myself after when you're finished second in a group one and your first ever runner in Ireland in a group one. And I said, I would have settled for it yet that morning. So I just said, Ronnie, do what you have to do. We, we knew there was going to be plenty of pace. They would go fast. Like in a sprint, they fa- they go fast no matter what. There's no, they, they, they don't, you never hear anyone coming in in a sprint and say they crawled. So they went, they were always going to go flat out and usually after two, two and a half furlongs, it's out with the, you know, the out and it's pushing and shoving and we knew this fellow would finish and I just said, Ronnie, take your time, try and get him in his comfort zone and keep him as close as you can to the front and, you know, to the leaders and that's exactly what he did do, except the French horse did get first run on the whole field and he's, she was drawn well, that horse was, but... Ronnie didn't panic, and that's what good jockeys do. They don't panic, and he knew he had the horse under him, and he out like out he came out like you know the way he finished. He was, I think, as I looked at the times and the splits, his last furlong was very fast. You know, how do they call a photo finish in France? Is it the same over here as when you're just waiting for the number and you're waiting and waiting and waiting? Or how was your French? How did you know he got up? I was looking at the screen, waiting for his pay for that number to come up, number three, and that's what I was doing. And up it came and. You know, the whole place just went mad. Um, I, I got a great reception, Ron, and got emotional. We all got emotional. It was just brilliant. Um, it's hard to describe the feeling, really. Uh, you know, when, when when it happens your first time, but especially in a, in a place like that, as I said, it's like the Champions League final, really, of sprinting, and that's exactly what it was like, and it's very hard to describe it, but it was just, it was just brilliant. And... Um, we we got a great reception of all those people that were there at the races. The you know the cheers and the roars we got coming walking up the gangway and even walking into the into the the parade ring was unbelievable. And I think my local vet was there and his two assistants were there and they come running down to me and shook you know go, gave us I got more pats in the back and everything it was just brilliant. You probably could have done with the vet on Monday morning, I'd say. I could have. I tell you that I needed juice Monday morning, <laughs> but look at. It was we we um, the whole occasion was just brilliant at that time. Johnny, it was, as I said, it was fantastic, and you know you just sort of say, "Am I dreaming? Am I dreaming?" But it was you know you never think it might happen to you. You'd often be sitting at home watching these races at home and saying, "God, wouldn't you love to be there?" And, you know, I'm very privileged that I was. I suppose, um, you know, much of the talk of sport this week and about football has been about Newcastle United and the takeover and how effectively it's impossible now for smaller clubs or, or very, very difficult for smaller clubs unless you have massive money to make it at the top level, obviously, in football. The story of this horse, Edo, is it, it just goes to show, like, that racing dreams really can come true. If you're listening to this... Um, on Friday night, we've obviously had the guys on speaking about the Barney Curley documentary and Bellustown is such an important part of that story. But Bellustown, such a small Irish racetrack and this is where it all began for a case of you before he joined you having run for John McConnell. Yeah, that's correct. And in in this game, like it, it is powered by... like It's like a lot of sport. It's powered by money. And um, the good thing about this game, you, you can buy you can buy a horse like this. I'm not saying that you'll go out every day of the week and find them, but you can go out there and, you, to me, you come across them rather than find them because you, you could buy 20 of them horses for that price. You could buy 100 at that price and never find one decent one. And he was a three grand yearling. And to get to buy a horse like that and end up where he is today, a group one winner, and, you know, he's won group races as well. It's just an unreal story, you know, we gave a lot more than what the three gram was, but it wasn't. He wasn't an expensive horse. He's a very, very cheap horse for us at the moment with his value, because he's still a colt and stood value as well. So, you know, it, it's it can happen, and it, it's you, you'll always go to the sales all the time. Like we've been at sales last week and the week before, and you'll always see lads scouting around there, and something cheap might come in, and one of these guys will take a shine to it and they'll buy it, and he could be a superstar. Nobody knows in this game until, like it is all about breeding. But there's always the one freak that will come out, you know, not well bred, and that, and he'll end up like this. And that's exactly what this horse is. He's just a, he's just a natural, and that's you know, it's just brilliant. But as I said, dreams can happen in this game. Well, I spoke. I spoke to a lad recently who invests in stocks, and he was he put himself off buying Zoom. 
um, after Zoom had doubled in value, we'll say, in the lockdown, because he said it's it's gone up, uh, it's doubled, it's not going to get much higher. And of course it did and it did and it did. Now this horse was three grand before he ran. When you're buying him, so you're buying him at the back end, we'll say, of, of his 2020 campaign, this is where it gets interesting because you're going to have to pay a lot more money. But the, the, the purchases that your yard has made for reasonably decent money, like so you're not you're not buying the top, but you're buying horses with proven ability, have gone really well. And how did this transaction take place? And tell us about the owner, Gary Devlin, as well. Yeah, look, at we, we uh, there was, I think there was a problem with it with an X-ray at one stage. The horse was sold to Hong Kong and Hong Kong is such a difficult place to get horses in with x-rays and mm. there was a little, one problem and we went back and the horse two months later and we, we looked at the horse and we we brokered a deal you know and we got him x-rayed fully fully x-rayed and sometimes especially horses that are immature especially two-year-olds there could be a little nodule on the knee or that and it'll never affect them but the likes of Hong Kong don't accept them and and um Touch wood, this guy, we, we got him x-rayed again and the vet passed him, you know, and it was actually the same vet and he sort of, he couldn't believe the change because the horse was after having a rest for two or three months and it's basically immaturity at this time and, you know, he passed him and we bought him and um, we, we brokered a deal to buy him and, as I said, Hong Kong have come back twice looking to buy him. And what does Gary say to that? I won't tell you, <laughs> it's not going to happen. You know, uh, it, it, like a horse, it's a once in a lifetime horse. He's won more money, prize money, than what we've paid for him at the moment, and he's worth a lot of money. And why would you want to sell something like that at this moment in time that you're going to have? You know, you, you you live for it for for a horse like this that's going to hopefully stay in training and stay sound next year, and and like he could take you all over the world. And in the heartbeat of that victory, like you now have a stallion prospect. So Gary is thinking, like I've I've a horse here who's obviously won a lot of prize money. He's won a Group One, and he must be thinking already now what what happens after his career and where do we go from here with this horse? Because he's only three. He's a Group One winner. He's a very good sprinter. Sprinters are always in demand as stallions. Um, and I suppose you're only into the next chapter of his story. Yeah, like um, some people will knock him on pedigree and and that and. That's why he's probably he was quite cheap because his pedigree wouldn't be as good as as other horses. But his sire, the hot streak stands in France at the moment, which would have been great for him. <coughs> excuse me, mm. for him winning last week. But um, uh, he he like it. He has to be marketed. Uh, the real good thing what you'd love to see is when he does retire to stud that some good mares go to him and he can breed some quite smart horses in the first two or three years of his of his stallion career and. If that happens, they can really take off then after that. And I can see no reason why he can't because he, he's such a laid back horse and, and he breed like he, he's so laid back at home and you'd never think he was a colt. And I think that's a key to some horse, like, you know, breeding horses because you don't want a mad old horse that's going to be hyper and breeding horses then that are hard and difficult. You know, you need them to be able to reserve as much energy as you can for racing. And I think this horse has it. And he probably do like when you take the likes of Kodiak, I think he started off at five grand. Memas is another horse that started off at five grand. Mm. Dark Angel was another, I think, six or seven grand horse. And these horses have all gone up because they produce such very good horses after. They've gone up into 60 and 70 grand covering fees now. And that's when they really start to bring in a lot of money. If, you know, if a horse can produce the goods and get his progeny to, to be very smart horses, then they can become very very good stallions but you know it it, it, it the, the, and there's a lot of marketing on on Just, studs to try and market a horse and sell a horse when he does go to studs so don't ask me where he's going to go for that but I'm sure he'll probably stay in Ireland if we could just get that photo up that we had there just momentarily, um, this is the beauty of horse racing and the beauty of these animals where you're you're basically beside the horse, he practically has a big smile on his face. Um, they have so much character. I mean, he basically looks like uh, he looks like a fellow who's who's just about to have a night out there and is basically free for the weekend. He couldn't have a care in the world. He's beside you, Edo. What's he like as a character at home? Because I, I guess yeah. the, just the character of these horses is so compelling as well. Yeah, he's a very intelligent horse, and um, even when you see him 
when he crosses the finish line, the two ears come up and he pricks his ears, and that's exactly what he's very intelligent. There's not a bad bone in his body, really. Um, he, he's he's a great character. He's great in the stable. You can take him out and bring him for his pick of grass and his roll and that, and he loves it. And you know, he he just he just has that good character. He's not overly hyped up. He doesn't get overly hyped up on that. And he got a little bit derived just before he went out, but he's, it was all very controllable and. That, that, I, to me it's very important every time I have a beer in the Carroll house now and Ricky is there it sounds or it seems like I'm part of uh, Team Aido McGuinness and I think this is something that struck me as well <laughs> he was texting me then on the Sunday night he said come on we're all going to Tipperary um, and even though like he's obviously one of your owners or whatever it's kind of yeah. isn't it a bit like if a, a club has one of their players gets onto the county team and everyone follows them it's part of that and that you're part of that story and you want you want your Aidan McGuinness to do well and you want your fellow owners to do well because you're part of the story as well I suppose yeah the guys actually there was a couple of Ricky's guys out last week that were out for current options and you know they were all in the parade ring when the other horse come in as well when when KCU come in and these guys they're a great bunch of guys they're involved in a lot of horses and you know they're just great guys to have gone racing, and that's what like that's what race goers are all about. Are these type of guys that come racing, and enjoy their day racing, have a beer and have a bite to eat, and you know love a little punt. They're not heavy punters or anything, but that's what you know. In my opinion, that's what racing is all about. Is guys like these. Friday Night Racing is brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland and obviously last week we were talking to a trainer about another uh, three-year-old stallion prospect in St. Mark's Basilica that was Aidan O'Brien and I guess I did make the point that one of the problems the flat has is that you get these three-year-old stars are then whisked off to create other horses rather than race themselves how long will this fella stay in training Aidan? Look at he'll probably stay in training next year and then I suppose it'll depend if we can bag another group one or two Group ones next year, he's going to be a very, very valuable stallion prospect. And at that stage, you could turn around and say, Listen, you know, he has to go to the breeding shed. And you can understand why then he he, he will. But I, I'm sure they'll race him on next year and then we'll sit down and hopefully he'll be a double or a travel group one winner when I'm talking to you this time next year. Happy days. Yeah, and people will be listening in and watching at home and they'll be saying, Aidan McGuinness now, he'll he'll have people knocking down his door to get horses, but it actually doesn't really work like that necess- necessarily, does it? No, look, we, we've had to work hard to gather in all these owners and get owners in and it's it's not easy and like it's all about capital as well and you know, we've been at the sales last week, Johnny. We bought yearlings last week, and we bought some the week before, and we bring them back, and you know, we try and syndicate some of them. Sometimes we've orders for some of them as well. But we're we're launching a new um, investments yearling scheme next week. We're going to launch that, and um, we we'll we have some yearlings there for that, and we're going to buy some more next week and the week after. So it's all about trying to get new stock in and new people in, and and you know, to get in and invest in the game and enjoy the game and it's ridiculous to me that Stephen Kenny is mentioned so much and there's very little said about the likes of Anthony Barry who's such a massive cog in the operation and it'll be all about Aidan McGuinness but there are so many cogs to your wheel as well in the stables up in North Dublin yeah look at it's it goes back down to the even the guys that muck out the, the stables of two brilliant guys that do that and, and you know the, they're to me they're a very important part of the yard. They keep the yard spotless. They muck out the horses every day. They clean the water buckets. They wash that. That's a very important part of the yard to the guys that ride out every day. You know, they look after the horses to the likes of Stephen, who uh, he's my assistant. He's there when I'm not there or he goes, he's gone to, he went to York this morning with, with a horse and my wife does the accounts and does, you know, bits and pieces around the, like whatever we need doing she she she's does all that and then I've my kids have three kids there and they help out as well so it's a big family affair but I still have a huge amount of staff like you know we've good staff on top of that and once they're all happy and they are all very happy but they work very hard and thankfully they're all getting rewarded at the moment and the, yeah anyone who visits your yard will be struck by I suppose the atmosphere there it's, it's such a friendly atmosphere but a, a couple of other key points I suppose is that it's adjoined to um, effectively a strawberry farm and also it's very very close to the sea which are two big parts of your life as well yeah look at I I walked on I, I grew strawberries for years and tomatoes long before I ever went training horses and 
the only other the only place I ever walked is on that farm since the day I was born. Like I, I've only ever walked there. I've never walked anywhere else in my life. Not even with horses. I, I I've just picked it up as I'd gone along and um said it, it's it's an unusual place for people. Some people go into big, you know, real fancy yards. Mine wouldn't be fancy, but it's a very practical yard that is run and you know, I think the main thing is horses are kept healthy, they're fed well and that's a huge part of it and that's ex- exactly what we do and we've got, you know, we've a good setup and the system that we work is working and it's working very well for us at the moment. How did the feeling of that victory compare to the ones you've had from say Vic Tram in the Imperial Cup back in the day to winning the, the big race at Galway? Was this different gravy altogether? Yeah, it was different. I'll never forget the likes of winning the first Galway Mile. I'll never, ever forget that. But um, to win a Group 1, I suppose it's a bit like winning the Champions League. Like, you know, you can win all the league championships, but when you go and win the Champions League, then it's, you know, it's different gravy altogether. And this definitely is. You have world-class trainers all around you and um, world-class jockeys. And, you know, jockeys come over to me the other day that I didn't know, shook my hand and said, well done. And, you know, after racing and that and... You know, it was just unreal, and we walked out of Longchamp the other day, and I had the trophy in my hand, and we were heading for the bus, and two English guys said to me, um, you know, what did you win? I said, we won the, the Abbey, and he said, you won the Abbey, and you're on a bus, you know, and the, you know, and I said, yeah, we're on the bus, but we had a great day, we had a great time even traveling back into Paris on the bus, the guys, we had, we had a great sing song with the English guys, and was one of these big long buses and they were dancing at the back of it and it was bouncing all over the place but you know that's the way we are and we're, we're, and that's the way we stay and you know it's the same in, in the yard you know it's a simple yard that works Yeah I actually remember being on the Ryanair flight back to uh, Dublin the day after See the Stars won the um, won the arc and there was Michael Canaan more or less 